What are some NHL draft prospect names that will be available for the Minnesota Wild at pick 24? What about the pick that they may get depending on where Kevin Fiala ends up? We take a look at some names for Wild fans to keep an eye on. Plus, Gabe Foley's latest NHL mock draft all today on Locked on Wild. You're locked on Wild. Your daily podcast on the Minnesota Wild. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's up? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of Locked On Wild, your daily Minnesota Wild podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thank you for making Lockdown Wild your first listen each and every day. And just a reminder, Lockdown Wild is available wherever you listen to your podcasts at absolutely no charge. On today's episode of Lockdown Wild, Gabe Foley of Recruit Scouting joins the show as we take a look at some names that may be available for the Wild at various points throughout the first round of the 2022 NHL Draft. We've also got a Foley's find for you in today's episode, and we'll take a look at Gabe's mock draft, his latest mock draft leading up to the draft coming up in the first full week of July. My name is Seth Topol, host of Lockdown Wilds, veteran Minnesota sports content producer and guiding you through the offseason here at the helm of Lockdown Wilds, and joined by a regular contributor to the show, one of the elite members of Recruit Scouting, none other than Gabe Foley. Gabe, the offseason continues for everybody except the Colorado Avalanche and the Tampa Bay Lightning, which means that we get a chance to uh, to talk plenty of NHL prospects. So let's uh, let's dive in and look at the thing we know, which is that the Wild will be picking at the uh, number 24 spot. There we go in the uh, first rounds of the 2022 NHL draft. Who are some names that could potentially be there for the wild at that spot? Yeah, there are a ton of names to go through um, because there's really no telling what the wild are going to do with that pick in a recent article for recruit scouting, laying out my mock draft that we'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, I discussed the fact that every, every single source I've talked to, sources that other reporters have been able to dig into, it seems like everyone's saying the same thing about how the Wild are approaching this draft, which is with the mindset of, we absolutely don't need this draft. The Minnesota Wild are not only a bona fide playoff team for years to come, they have arguably a top five prospect pool in the NHL with amazing depth at every position. I mean, there's really no need. And so they're going into this draft swinging for the fences. So in my mock draft article, I had the Wild taking Ivan Marashnyshenko, who was uh, a year ago today a lock for the top five in this draft. But heading into this season, he had a little bit of issues with getting ice time with his team in the and then actually around mid-season was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, the same cancer that uh, put Mario Lemieux's career on pause for a few years. Um, I will say Marashnyshenko is completely cleared to begin training for next season. He is healthy. He is good. He is going to keep playing hockey. But of course, there's inherent doubt, skepticism that comes with a diagnosis of that, uh, of that level. But like I said, a year ago today, this kid was considered a top five talent and for great reason. I mean, when he got minutes, when he played internationally, Marashnyshenko looked great. He was a absolute pure goal scorer in the light of players like Vladimir Tarasenko. Maybe he's not the quickest, most agile player in the NHL, but he knows how to get open. He knows how to create space. And he knows how to punish teams with his shot once he gets that space. Marashnyshenko also has a really nice grit to his game that I think the Wild will like. And we can't talk about Russian prospects without bringing up the inherent doubt 
that comes with drafting a Russian this year. But if any team's going to be able to get a high caliber Russian over, it's the team that's turned Kirill Kaprizov into a top five player in the NHL, which that's a whole other conversation. We need to start recognizing Kaprizov for what he is. Good luck. Thank you. Oh, I love that, man. Um, but that's not to say that there are, are other options besides Marash Nishenko. Marash Nishenko is, of course, the riskiest pick. But there are a few safer ones. That includes uh, Noah Osland, who plays for Jurgardens in uh, Sweden's U20 league. Osland is a really flashy playmaking forward, likes making defenders look silly and then finding uh, the teammate with a crisp pass and uh, just a really pretty player, has a hard nose for the corners, knows how to play the two-way game. Uh, he's a guy that looks reliable and um, is going to be reliable moving forward. And a player that can really fit in anywhere in the center depth chart said about Isaac Howard. Ike Howard, uh, as he has been so lovingly nicknamed, is kind of the same deal. A playmaking talent with a nose for the net, a nose for the corner, and a uh, work ethic that goes beyond really anyone in this class. Uh, Judd Bracken, the Wild team, love their NTDP players. They're all over them all year long. And so Ike Howard, who is a person that I personally don't have ranked in my first round, uh, but someone that's getting a ton of love could be another great option for the Wild. And then just real quick, I'll touch on the defense as well. There are a ton of defensemen to keep in mind, and they're all left defensemen, which, correct me if I'm wrong, that's what we need, right? I think... I'm not crazy? I, I'm going to look because I believe that is actually the glut that oh, uh, no. the Wilds currently possess, but I um, I don't know why, because I literally just talked about this the other day, and so I don't know why it's um. Oh yeah, the only the only two. Well, there are three left. Are there are three right shot defensemen in the entire oh no like, extended organization? It's Addison, Pat Dumba, and uh, Jared Spurgeon. That's it. All right, well, we can talk about some right defensemen then. Ruining my tempo, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I said, ton of defensemen to be aware of. A great defenseman that will almost certainly be there around 24 is Ryan Chesley. Ryan Chesley is another player who I personally don't have ranked in my first, but he is getting a ton of first-round attention from NHL teams. He is a defense-first player who's great. Anytime he, he maybe bites too much, overcommits, gets beat, He's great on the back check. He's great at making up for the mistakes that he does make every now and then and really doesn't make a ton of mistakes. He's strong in transition. He knows how to play with an active stick, and he plays physical. And when he does break the puck up, Chesley's great at sparking a breakout, moving up the ice quick, which, of course, is the heart of the Minnesota Wild offense as you look at guys like Matt Boldy, Kevin Fiala with an asterisk next to him because who knows where he's playing next season. But Kaprizov... Even guys like Felino, I mean, you're seeing they use pace in transition on the breakout to burst into the neutral zone and really catch teams off guard. Uh, Ryan Chesley is a defense first defenseman that fits into that mold and knows how to play that style of game. So right defenseman to keep in name. If you are looking at uh, bogging down the left defense side a little bit more, players like Denton Matejchuk will be there. Matejchuk, I have ranked 11th. So I think getting him at 24 would be a godsend. Um, reminds me a lot of really poised two-way players uh, like you know Alex Petrangelo types. Those guys that maybe take a bit to settle into the league but are going to turn into really solid, just well-rounded guys. The same can be said about Owen Pickering, who will definitely be available. Another left defenseman, big body. I think he's 6'3", 6'4". Um, but just a guy that has a spunk to his game has a speed even with his size, likes joining the rush, likes joining the offense, and um, a guy that looks like he'll pan out as a professional in the years to come. So I absolutely scraped the surface. This isn't the deepest draft, but it's also really deep in some spots because everyone's just kind of on the same playing field. So I think Mirage Nishenko is a perfect option. I think Osland, Ike Howard, Jimmy Snuggerud, who for all intents 
and purposes in my eyes is the second coming of blues prospect Jake Neighbors, who has turned into a really highly touted prospect in his own right. Uh, Snuggerud's there. Matejchuk might be. Pickering def- definitely will be. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll close this out by touching on Lane Hudson, who I uh, try to fit into every conversation I can. Lane Hudson is, if we're being generous, 5'8", 145 pounds, 18 years old. That's not great. That's not an nhl size player. But Lane Hudson is maybe the most impressive defenseman I've ever seen. Um, I have spoken with people in the public sector. I've spoken people with people in the private sector. I've spoken with people at every level of hockey scouting. And all of them seem to agree that if Lane Hudson was six foot, he'd be the first round pick this year. I mean, the, the wow. talent that he has with the puck on his stick, the instinct he has, um, his ability to make players look goofy, just absolutely silly on the blue line, just dancing through him with the puck. He creates chances. Uh, he knows how to go coast to coast and score goals for all intents and purposes. I mean, Lane Hudson is an all-star defenseman. He's just an all-star defenseman in a real tiny package. So uh, I don't know what to make of Lane Hudson's draft stock. I've heard people say he won't be drafted at all. I've heard some people say he's going to be in the three to five range, third to fifth round range. I've heard some people say that teams might take a swing on him in the first, second round. And uh, wow. as we're talking about 24th overall, absolutely nothing to lose. As we're talking about a team who has made undersized defensemen like Jared Spurgeon into star defensemen, I think Minnesota Wilder, uh, Lane Hudson, if they're not looking at the long list of guys we've discussed so far. So certainly a ton of options at 24 and uh, really no clear way to predict which way the Wild are looking right now. Okay, you have uh, you have piqued my interest with those names. Now, the other portion to this is that that may not be the only first round pick that the Wild have. So we are going to look at some of the other spots they may potentially draft in the first round, depending on how things play out with trades and so on. And uh, so we'll take a look at some of those other spots with names that could be there as well as we continue today's episode of Locked on Wild after this. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including the Stanley Cup final, Major League Baseball season, as well as NFL futures. BetOnline.net is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. So head to their website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. You can find all of that and more at BetOnline, where the game starts. Continuing today's episode of Locked on Wild. And uh, once again, thank you for making Locked on Wild your first listen each and every day. Listeners, we have an important favor to ask of you. We've put together a survey so that we can learn more about listeners like you and make your favorite Locked on podcast even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you like and don't like about Locked on Podcasts. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now to get things started. It won't take very long, and everyone that completes a survey can qualify for a chance to win one of 10 $100 Ticketmaster gift cards. To take our audience survey, go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Thank you for your participation. Seth Topal hanging out with Gabe Foley of Recruit Scouting. There are some potential spots in which the Wild could find themselves with an additional first-round pick, such as the Ottawa Senators at 7. The New York Islanders at 13. And so what we're going to do is uh, look at some players who may be available in those particular spots. New Jersey Devils at two, probably a little too high, but we will take a look at uh, the second round selection for the Devils just to see who's there. So let's start with seven. Gabe, who are some of the names that will be available around the seventh 
overall pick. If the Wild do pull the uh, the trigger and get that pick for Kevin Fiala. Yeah, so when we look at the range of six to nine, about four or five, four or five names come to mind. We have Joaquin Kamel, uh, Math- Matthew Savoie, Frankie Nazar, tentatively, Cutter Goche, Kevin Korczynski. I think those are the big five names. And I'll tell you, I think the Columbus Blue Jackets are going to go with Joachim Kamel at six. That Scandinavian connection, Finland and Sweden's just too strong. I mean, it's Yarmo. He loves right. taking Europeans, so I don't think Joachim Kamel will be there. Um, and I don't know. I, I, I don't feel like Matthew Savoie would be on the Wilds radar. Uh, he's fallen a bit in recent months, and I don't know if his draft stock is where it was. So that leaves us with Cutter Goche, Frankie Nazar, and Kevin Korchinski. I'll touch on each of those players in turn, uh, starting with Goche. Cutter Goche is a whoa, 6'2", 180 forward, I believe. I think that might be uh, undersizing him a bit. He's a big guy. He plays a uh, physical, smart style of hockey. He's not afraid to bully you around, uses a great IQ to get into good positioning in the middle lane, and then use a strong, hard, just clear shot uh, to embarrass a goalie. At seven, I actually had Gochi to go to the Senators. The Senators have really favored players like Goche in the past with guys like Tyler Boucher, uh, Zach Obst- Ostapchuk, uh, Ridley Grieg, Robbie Jarventi, Shane Pinto, all players that play that slow, monotonous style. And it sounds like Goche is actually a bit of a sleeper to enter that top five, top six category. So getting him at seven would probably be something that uh, angered NHL GMs, but I don't think the Wild look at Goche either. Um, so that leaves, it with, leaves us with Nazar and a left defenseman, excuse me, playing in the WHL. First off, I just want to say I am pretty confident that the Wilds' connection to the WHL is going to be really strong throughout this entire draft. I think they've been eyeing it all year long. I know that the Wild have a short list of WHL players that they want to fall into their lap. So maybe Kevin Korczynski would make a lot of, a lot of sense at uh, seven overall. Korczynski is a defenseman whose stock is absolutely skyrocketed this season, gone from next to nothing to being considered a top 10 consensus pick. Um, And while I don't agree with that, in fact, I have Korczynski kind of around my 40-50 range. Um, I totally see what scouts see in him. Korczynski is a bit of an awkward skater, a bit of a, a galloper in some aspects. But once he gets that gallop going, man, he builds up speed quick. He's confident with the puck. He knows how to carry the puck out of the zone and into the zone and uh, loves joining the offense. And um, more than that, loves walking the blue line, knows how to do it, knows how to walk the blue line in ways that open him up on the perimeter and open him up in the slot, which means that Kevin Korczynski is always a solid passing option, always a solid passing outlet um, on the blue line, which is not something you get to say about every single defenseman. And then once he does get the puck on his stick, Korczynski can really score from anywhere. There have been goals that he's scored where the puck's been on the blue line. I mean, nearly off sides, but he's rifled it and picked it top corner or something. It's a really impressive shot. It's a really mature shot. Now, I, as I mentioned, I have a pretty big discrepancy between consensus and where I have Korczynski ranked. And I think that's largely because his style of walking the blue and finding ways to get into the high slot or maybe along the perimeter and down uh, below the net, below the crease. Um, I don't know if those will translate as seamlessly into the NHL as some are thinking. I also think he might have a tougher time with his shot uh, because, of course, there's just more to the pros. And looking at the other aspects of his game outside of his offense, Wachinski has had some struggles uh, making the right decision on the regroup, sometimes he lo- he's a little goofy in his own zone, and sometimes he can really not utilize his size and strength in the right ways 
um, in transition. So it makes him kind of easy to beat. Um, so a lot of question marks to be made. But when we talk about boom bust players in this draft class, Kevin Korczynski is damn near the top of the list. And like I said, the Wild are having fun this year. I think Judd Brackett's putting on the shades, sipping a pina colada and kicking it up at the draft this year. Like, I would not expect anything less than a, you know, Hawaii floral button up. Um, so I give us the boomer bus. Kate. Give us the guy that can replace some of the older left defensemen on the wild system who are on their way out. But uh, I, like I said, I don't know if Korczynski is necessarily the right fit. I don't know if he's the guy that I would pick. The guy that I would pick would be Frank Nazar the third. Frankie Nazar is another player who is extremely hotly debated. I've heard some scouts talk about Frankie Nazar second round pick. I've heard some scouts talk about him in the 20s. I've heard a lot of scouts. In fact, the consensus has him slated somewhere in the 10s, you know, 10 to 20. But I've been on conversations with five or six private sector scouts from every level, from NHL to juniors to uh, tier one in America. Scouts have told me, you know, they think Nazar's out there with Logan Cooley. And, and the amount of times I've been asked, is Frankie Nazar a better pick than Logan Cooley? Should Nazar be ranked higher? Is, I mean, it's, it's insane. It's incredible. And that tells you just how high the ceiling is for Frankie Nazar. I mean, he's being compared to the guy who is the consensus third overall pick. Frankie Nazar is one of those players who is maybe a bit too good for his own good because he's definitely slowed down a bit this year. He's been a little bit lazy at times. He's one of those players that um, has it in him to make everyone look silly, but maybe doesn't always show it. And uh, that leaves a lot of question marks for Nazar's future uh, as a prospect, I mean, really, how much of that does he have in him? Is he going to be the star that he, we've seen out of him every now and then? Or is he going to flounder once he gets onto a big stage? Um, I'm personally betting on Frankie Nazar going with the former and really turning into a speedy, exciting, uh, high-intensity forward that can play at the top levels uh, in the pros. And I think that whatever track he takes next year, whether that be going to University of Michigan as he's signed for uh, with his national letter of intent or going to the OHL, which is kind of where I see him going, uh, both options are on the table for him. And I think both really serve to develop that high intensity, high octane offense that Nazar likes to play. Um, again, another player that has that boom or bust upside that, what really is he question around him, but a player that I think that the wild would really like he's 5'10, 5 5'11, 5 plays a speedy, skillful game. He can play center. In fact, he's played center most of the year, but he's also been deployed at left wing and right wing because he's so talented that you can really put him wherever you can pair him with whoever. Um, when I think of Frank Nazar and how he plays hockey, I think of guys like Kevin Fiala and guys like Dylan Larkin. Um, these really high octane guys who build speed through their strides and love, I mean, you can tell they just live for the flashy moments of the game. So if Fiala's out, bring in Nazar, see what he can be. Um, and if Fiala stays, bring in Nazar because he can play on the offside wing. He can play <laughs> wherever you need him. And I'll tell you right now, if the Wild end up with Frankie Nazar and they put him with Matt Boldy and Kevin Fiala, that's that line's going to be better than, I mean, ninety percent of the top lines in the NHL. Um, so, for options at seven, again, it's a lot. This is a confusing and stressful draft, but I could see the Wild going with Frankie Nazar. Oh my goodness, that would be fantastic! But we got to get that pick first. That's the key. Got to get the pick before you can do anything with it. So, we'll. Um, We'll take a look at uh, some other potential spots at both 13 and gliding down into the second round. when We finish today's episode of Locked on Wilds after this. Final segment of today's episode of Locked on Wild. Once again, 
Thank you for choosing Lockdown Wild as your first listen each and every day. Seth Topol hanging out with Gabe Foley. And Gabe will finish with, let's start with number 13. The New York Islanders have that pick currently. But if they end up uh, taking on Kevin Fiala's services, we could likely get that pick back in return. So who would be some players available in kind of that next tier? You you mentioned six through nine, maybe kind of including some guys that could be around 10 as well. What where Who would be available around that number 13 overall pick? Yeah, so believe it or not, 13 is actually a lot more clear cut than that top 10 range. Uh, looking at 13, there are really only three players that I could see the Wild ending up with. And that would be uh, Brad Lambert who we've all known loved Marco Casper, who has gotten a ton of attention in recent months. And uh, I'd have to say Daniela Yurov. Those are three forwards. And uh, who knows if the wild are actually going to opt for forwards in this year's draft. I really wish I could just get in the mind of Judd Brackett, um, but we'll touch on them in turn again, starting with Brad Lambert, who I have to say it. I said it earlier about Ivan Roshenshenko, Brad Lambert, a year ago today, was considered a lock for the top five of this draft class. He was everything. When you talked about Shane Wright, you talked about Brad. It's been for three or four years. Brad Lambert jumped into Finland's men's league two seasons ago, I believe, and phenomenal. He looked like he belonged right away, and he... The only issue is... He hasn't really grown. We haven't seen a lot of development from Brad Lambert since he joined Finland's uh, top league, the Liga. Um, it's been a confusing development path for Brad Lambert, one that's certainly docked his draft stock. I could see him falling well past 13, well into like 18, 19 territory. Um, I have him slated to go to the Islanders in 13 in my mock draft at 13, almost solely because of the fact that Brad Lambert's uncle just got named the head coach of the New York Islanders. And if there's one thing that Lou Lamor Lamorello loves, it's nepotism. Um, classic <laughs> Lou loves his nepotism. So I think that Lambert, if he goes top 15, would go to the Islanders. If the Wild get that pick, I don't know if they're eyeing him. Maybe they want the risky pick, but... Like I said, there's reason to doubt Brad Lambert. So if I'm um, trying to predict who the Wild go with at 13, I'm scratching Lambert off the list. That leaves us with Marco Kasper and Danila Yurov. Marco Kasper was a center man, uh, sometimes occasional right winger, or Rogel BK of the SHL all season long. He played in the Champions League with them. And then um, this past spring, summer, played in the world championship with Austria, where he's from, um, and was always, did not matter where he played, did not matter what tournament, what league, whatever, was always a top six guy. Always, always beckoned on to be a reliable piece of wherever he was. And that's really starting to get NHL teams' attentions. Uh, at the world championships, a men's tournament, Marco Casper played at least 15 minutes in upwards of 2021 20, every single night. And he always looked solid. He looked like the heart of an Austrian team that damn well needed a heart because we all know that Austria is not exactly uh, screaming with NHL talent. Uh, but Marco Casper was the backbone of that team. He plays a really forward game. He fights to get into the slot. He fights to get into the corner. He's not scared of anything, even at his age, and he knows how to use his sides to his, his advantage um, when he's in those battles, wherever they may be. Casper is not a flashy player. I'll say that right now. He's not a player that's going to embarrass you with his skill or put up 35 goals in the NHL, but he's a guy that you put into your lineup next year and feel good about for the next 10 years. Doesn't matter whether that's second line center, third line center, second line right winger, if you really need it. Casper can play, need him to, and he has a hard nosed style uh, that I think NHL teams are just obsessed with. Some rumors have slated Casper as a top 10 player come draft day, with uh, NHL teams loving him that much. I'll give him that much credit, but I think nonetheless, he's a 
certain top 15 talent uh, by merit and by NHL hype and a player that will um, potentially be there at 13. Only issue is at 12, Yarmo picks again. And as we touched on, Yarmo Kekalainen loves his Europeans. He loves his undervalued Europeans. So I could see Casper going to Columbus at 12 rather than Minnesota at 13. But of course, it's also worth touching on one of the people that Marco Ross or Marco Casper, excuse me, has looked up to uh, his entire playing career has been fellow star Austrian Marco Rossi. That's a connection. That's a connection that the Wild will want to have. And you're looking at your solid, you know, second line, third line, center of the future if you bring them both in. So another great name to keep in mind, but maybe not the best uh, that would be available at 13. I'd say the best that would be available would be our last option in Daniela Yurov. Now, I will get out of the way right now. I have heard NHL scouts, you know, juniors level scouts, tier one scouts. I've heard from multiple people that Daniela Yurov is the next Russian phenom. I wish I could describe his game in a way that justifies that uh, that claim because I really agree. In fact, Daniela Yurov is fourth on my personal rankings right now, but I I feel like I can't describe it. I, I feel like he's so difficult to describe because I think he does everything well. Do you want a forward that can go out and embarrass the de defense with some slick skating and nice little stick handling? Daniela Yurov can do that. Do you need desperate defense and a two-way guy that can force the puck out of the zone and try and get your team some semblance of momentum? Yurov did that daily when he played in Russia this year. Do you need a high-scoring player that, you know, knows how to play the middle lane, knows how to adapt with teammates, and um, just can really blend into a lineup, no matter, you know, what the ask, what the matchup is? Yurov does that, too. I mean, it's incredible. He's a smooth skating, smart, constantly aware forward with so many intangibles to his game um, that just make him such an attractive prospect. Like I said, I have him fourth on my board, but he's not going to go that high uh, come NHL draft day. In fact, there's a world where Yurov does not go top 20. And that is solely, I mean, nearly solely because he is a Russian in this draft class. A lot of people are envisioning that Danila Yurov could feel the effect of this Russian bias more than any other prospect relative to their draft ranking where they deserve to go. Because not only is Yurov a Russian in this draft class, he's also been tossed around and kicked around a ton in Russia this year. Kind of the same story with Ivan Marashnashenko. Uh, Yurov is not getting the playing time he deserves. And it's because he is too good to play in the juniors leagues in Russia. But maybe not good enough to play in the KHL, you know, the second best league in the world. And so he's, it's tough. It's been a tough road for Yurov. That lack of playing time combined with a lack of exposure in international tournaments because of his age um, is certainly making things a bit difficult. But uh, there is reason to be optimistic. I believe Yurov has an Ameri a North American agent, which does make the process of coming over to North America a little bit easier. Um, but again, we talked about with Marash Nishenko, we'll talk about with Yurov. If a team's going to take a swing on a high-profile Russian and try and get him over to North America, it's going to be the team that just did it with Kirill Kaprizov. Daniil Yurov is a star in the making, I think. I think he has boundless upside, and I think that's not going to be reflected come draft day. But again, like we said with Marash Nishenko, who we've said a lot of the same things about, if any team's going to take that swing and shoot for the, you know, shoot for the fences, try and get the best that they can, it's going to be the Minnesota Wild who don't need a star center. Well, you have, uh, as always, provided some very compelling names. And so uh, we're going to take that into advisement. Now, obviously, um, we'll we'll have to do a uh, an additional show. I mean, we got time before the, uh, the we have draft. Plans, so we'll have to do a show. Time talking about some second round names that could potentially be there if the wild do end up going for that second round pick from the devils two overall i think is a little steep but i don't know why i'm doing this but anyway hey, you're um, right. it's a good hand motion 
Yeah, we we got some names that uh, that you can uh, kind of keep an eye on here. And so, uh, final thing that I'll leave you with is make sure to check out Gabe's mock uh, first round mock drafts at recruitscouting.com. Also, make sure to follow Gabe at NHL Foley on Twitter. We've got a lot more coming up as we get closer and closer to the NHL draft. So make sure you are staying up to date with everything wild related at Lockdown Wild and everything draft related here at Lockdown Wild as well. We have new episodes coming your way every Monday through Friday as part of the Locked On Sports Podcast Network.